Thank you. Um, I'll just kind of hang out by my laptop here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, it's good to be here. So I confess this is not a go talk. Um, if you feel gypped or deceived, feel free to get your tomatoes out. But before you throw them at me, I want you to know that everything in this talk I learned by doing Go projects. So hopefully that counts. Um, how many, I, I love these local events. How many of you are from around here? Pretty much everyone. Who is it? Who is with Weave specifically? Okay, that's actually, that's really good. We got a lot of outsiders. And then how many of you are from out of state? No way, where? El Paso. El Paso. Wow. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to the, the mountains of Utah. So um, I think it's great to talk with local groups and visitors as well. So I am excited that you're all here. Um, I wanna talk about um, this problem of this asymmetry and open source. Um, and I said that I gained all this experience from a Go project. You've heard of the Caddy web server, I guess, but um, this was a picture of our website a couple of years ago, uh, several years ago now, actually, um, before V2 was released, everything was butterflies and rainbows and we were a happy little open source project, right? But actually under the hood, we were more like this. I kind of love this image. I didn't make this. This came from like a hit piece against the project a few years ago. And I was <laughs> I was trying to make it sustainable and figure out how to fund its ongoing development and how to contribute back to the, the internet community. Um, and uh, some people didn't like it. But I learned a lot about growing open source projects. Um, how many of you participate in open source, some degree or another? Okay, so maybe half or more. And how many of you maintain an open source project? A few, a handful, okay, that's awesome. Um, well, I hope that all of you can get something from this as participants and as maintainers, um, because uh, there's there's kind of a problem in open source, and I call it an asymmetry where things are not really balanced, like this poor crab. Um, and so what is the asymmetry of open source, though? Uh, and by the way, I apologize. If you were here at Weave a few weeks ago, you probably will fall asleep because I already gave this talk to, you or to your company. But um, the, this asymmetry in open source is, I would describe it simply as, Users need open source projects. I think we could agree on that, right? We all use open source projects and users include companies and organizations too. But open source projects don't need users. And I know you might say, Matt, what are you talking about? Open source without users? That does not, that doesn't even count. And you're kind of right, but honestly, the vast majority of open source projects don't really have users other than maybe the author. And even then they tend to just kind of get abandoned. I don't use more than half of my open source projects anymore. And I don't think anyone else does either. Um, and you can just find that out by looking at the sheer number of repositories that are on GitHub. There's over 330 million repositories on GitHub and that's growing super fast um, compared to the number of developers. And interestingly though, 97% of all companies use open source projects I think this is actually low. I think it's more close to 100%, and some companies are just in denial or ignorant. Um, or they're auto mechanics. Or they are auto mechanics, but I bet even they use open source projects. Um, so somewhere in the Windows stack of their little like point of sale system, there's an open source project. So I don't know. Um, I want you to think about this real quick. You write some code, you put it on GitHub. Um, not a big deal, it's just something a weekend project. Maybe you update it once in a while. And then two things happen. There's two scenarios here. One is someone uses your code for a school project. And in the other scenario, uh, a hospital deploys your code as part of their emergency room software. So uh, I want you to think about that. And I wanna ask you if there's a difference here. Is anything? 
Is anything different about these? And I don't know if we can we be interactive. Is that okay, Mariah? I don't care. This is a priority in person conference. So do it at once. All right, yeah. So raise your hand or shout it out if you think there's a difference. And if so, what is it? Or if there's not a difference, why not? Just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. So stop starts with if your license covers liability. Okay, license covering liability. That's a good point. Hospital, that's a little scary, right? And I, I say hospital here, but it could be like a large organization like Wikipedia. It could be the Panama Canal. It could be a Fortune 500. But yeah, liability. What else? Consequences. Consequences. What do you mean by that? Uh, you don't want someone to die. You don't want someone to die. Exactly. Um, it's probably not going to die. And I mean, there's a whole big question if are you responsible? Like, are you party to that, right? If something happens. So liability. Yeah. What else, Nick? I think intention. Was I intending for oh. the system to be used this way? Did I account for that? How I built it? Right. So your intention as a developer. So now it's back to on, on this side of the, the authoring of it. Huh? Revenue. Hospital makes money off the things they do. Jane's not going to get paid off that project unless it's a really good project. Yeah, that's okay. We hospitals make a ton of money. We just got our hospital bill uh, <laughs> for an hour in the ER. It is ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I want you to just this has happened to me, by the way, these scenarios. And so this is a real thing, but there is a difference, I think. And, and maybe there's not, but we'll talk about that. I think both answers are right because. It could be it could be a difference to you if you depending on how you attach yourself to things and what your intentions are or um, and so let's 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 look at this here. So as projects have more users, they become less sustainable just inherently. I think we can see this from our own experience. If a project has no users, it's infinitely sustainable. And if it has users like infinite users, everyone on planet Earth is using it it's unsustainable. And so we could ask ourselves, why is that true? We'll look at that. And then how do we turn this growing user base into resources and assets? Um, how do we make a community out of it? The project unsustainable in the first place. Why does having more users make it unsustainable? Like in theory, in a vacuum, people could download your code and like everyone on planet Earth could do that and doesn't change you or the project, right? Well, it kind of does as like natural side effects start to happen where people open issues and make contributions because they they want to give back and they you have to now do code review and then or they ask questions and, and ask for help. Um, and then you get kind of stressed and you start to lose motivation as your backlog grows and then you get burned out. Can anyone relate to this? Doesn't have to be open source. <laughs> yeah, chuckles, laughing. Yep. Okay, so I think the sustainability problem really is not about large user bases because, again, in theory, it doesn't matter if people download your code. It's it's that they go unchecked. There's not a checks and balance. There's an asymmetry. There's um, kind of a gap created by open source licenses that when there's not boundaries put in place. So open source licenses are great. Someone talked about liability. They do cover some of the really important points where we developers are, can't be sued. Well, you can't win, hopefully win a lawsuit against an open source developer because of the no liability clause. And also, uh, we don't want to have to deal with warranties. So the, there's an as is clause in, in open source licenses. And also, we kind of want credit for our work, right? Like, it's nice to just, you know, copyright so and so, or um, that you helped contribute to this other project or product. Um, well, we also, some of us want to kind of improve our code and make our project better based on how it's being used. But open source licenses don't actually grant this to us, don't grant us this privilege because anyone can just take it and use it and redistribute it. Well, there's a few other things that open source licenses don't really account for that we developers like, and that is to eat food and have a place to sleep and pay our bills and not go to jail. And open source licenses uh, do not help us here, unfortunately, because all our software is free of charge. Licenses are really good at telling companies and users what they can and can't do. 
Um, and open source licenses in particular are really good at the can part, but they kind of fail on the can't part or maybe yeah. shouldn't. Um, so we can't really change open source licenses and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, if we can leverage them to help solve this sustainability problem, a lot of licenses will have this as is clause and this should make companies nervous because this means that they are completely on their own there's no safety net there's no uh, recourse if something goes wrong they have to put a plea out to a community forum or find some random post on reddit that probably went unanswered four years ago and this should make again this should make them nervous but uh maybe a responsible company would take some initiative to kind of own, kind of like uh, Jason just talked about in his last talk with Ted, own your code base, own your problems. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this here. Developers, so we maintainers, can help encourage this or promote this by setting boundaries. And if you talk to any decent therapist, you'll know that boundaries seriously is, is essential for like any healthy functional relationship. And liberal, li liberal licenses don't really set boundaries for us, um, which is, is great. I love the freedom of them, but we just need to learn how to set boundaries. And I think actually both parties can set boundaries. And once you set boundaries, you start to have checks and balances in your system and in your community that um, begin to kind of uh, rebalance things. So I'm, I'm actually going to suggest that open source projects can be sustainable, but it just requires leadership from companies and maintainers to set boundaries, own their code bases and their problems, and, um, and work out these relationships together. So uh, here are some examples of some healthy boundaries that companies might set. These are, I think, responsible things. I think this kind of shows leadership and initiative in your organization. Um, this is a little wordy, but you can get it on my website too. But you'll notice a theme, though, is that a lot of these are about um, just kind of, again, being aware of what technology you're relying on and not expecting other people to fix it for you. Um, so going down your dependency tree, owning your own requirements and standards, not using projects that aren't a good fit. And if they aren't a good fit, you either don't use them or you, you invest in making them a good fit for you. Um, why, like, why would you deploy software that is part of your organization that you can't support and don't have support for? You would never do that, right? Like you would never deploy code that you didn't test right i know we all do it but i'm just saying that maybe we shouldn't so um maintainers you can also set boundaries as a maintainer and i think we talk about this a little less often businesses are used to business relationships but maintainers sometimes we forget about ourselves and we love to people please or we love to um uh, i don't know we we kind of forget what our limits are. So these are some boundaries that I kind of thought of that you could use for, as an example. Um, for example, I you can reject changes. So if someone submits a pull request, it's okay to close it or ignore it. Um, donations, someone pays you some money, that's not a contract, it's okay. Someone can just give you a thank you, give you the warm fuzzies. And honestly, you don't even have to accept donations. Too much pressure, no problem. It's okay to not accept donations. Um, you can let users help each other. I I just can't keep up anymore in the caddy forum. I used to be able to read every single thread that came in. I can't do that anymore. And um, so I rely on the community to help each other. And I, uh, so I actually, a boundary that I set early on is that I don't give support for free uh, in private. And I'm starting to <laughs> get to a point where I can't really afford to do that in public either very often. Um, especially to companies, at least. So I'll help individuals. But um, I also, I favor locals just because it's more fun that way. But um, but yeah, like I don't give help in private to companies. Don't do that. That's, 
I mean, you can, but why would you do that? Because you're not even helping like the broader community, you know, and you're just giving a company proprietary knowledge for free. Like I would, I would charge for that. Um, you can, uh, you can take your time getting around to issues and pull requests, especially those that you're not being paid for. So there's lots of things that lots of boundaries you can set for yourself to kind of um, help uh, encourage an equal footing in open source. Now, um, one question, of course, that you might come back to is, well, I still need to eat, sleep, and pay the bills. So where do where do I get the money for that? Because the software is free. <laughs> and I mean, true. Some, some time ago, a few weeks ago, someone sat down next to me and asked me what I do for work. And I told them I sell free software. <laughs> and a discussion ensued. And <laughs> that led to this talk. So, I mean, yeah, where do you get the money? Well, that kind of depends on who your market is. <clears throat> so if you, there's three, I don't know, there's probably more than three main sectors, but I like to think of three sectors here for simplicity. You have consumers, you have businesses, and you have investors. Investors in open source is kind of rare. That's also very stressful. And <laughs> I'm not going to go into that right now. That's a great topic for another day. But um, Consumers and businesses are typically going to be your market um, for making for raising funds for your project. Now, if you choose consumers, and if that just happens to be your your huge market, I would just let you know that might be a lot of work. Um, most consumers don't know what open source is, uh, and they don't know how to use it, and they're probably used to paying pocket change per month, you know, think of like streaming services, which are, gosh, now they're like $15 a month. But a few months ago, they were like $5 a month. And that's kind of what they're used to paying backup services, five, six, seven dollars a month. Um, you will probably need thousands <clears throat> of consumers as your customers. So if you do go that route, I would encourage you to focus maybe on the enthusiasts and the kind of the techie side of, of the market or prosumers, so to speak. And you can price your things boldly. We'll talk about things here in a minute, but build up some hype. So you can do mailing lists, marketing stuff. It's just going to take more of your time. So consumers, you're just going to be potentially devoting a lot of time. I, I read that uh, there's a 3D printing project that was looking for funding here just the other day I saw. And I'm not into the 3D printing world, but I mean... I'm sure they have a bajillion consumer users and probably several business users too. And it's just, you have to like figure out where you're going to get most of your money. I mean, you can go on Patreon and get sponsors for two, five dollars a month, or you can get a couple of businesses that pay a thousand dollars a month. So think about that. They have money and they pay money. That's kind of their gig. So I'm going to mostly focus on businesses because I think that's a lot easier to manage. And I think that will have the greatest change in this short amount of time for open source ecosystems. When you're selling software to businesses, I've learned that company size matters a lot more than how much they use your software or rely on it. Um, and once they do purchase, they're usually pretty committed. They're not usually going to put something in production and then take it out a month or two later. Um, you might have to kind of work with them to get past the experimental phase or that we're trialing it out. Once you get past that, though, and they commit, they're usually in because they don't want to touch it once it's once it's there. Um, and also, when you're working with businesses, it's really easy. I was talking to the Arc loan developers, you know, an awesome project. And one of my top pieces of feedback initially was raise your prices. Like, this is not a flea market. You are the world expert on this really valuable software, this really valuable project. And I think all projects are valuable, by the way. It just depends who is using them and what they're using it for. But um, definitely, like, you know, consider that when you when you set your pricing. No one knows your software better than you, and businesses will pay for that world expertise. Um, so here's a few ideas, and I mean, you can ask me later. I've I've tried a few things, most of which are unpopular, like um, dual licensing or um, various like add-on services and stuff. And 
honestly, the things that worked best for me are here in bold, but um, sponsorships and support and custom development work, you can do it. There's a ton of these things, though, that you can charge for. Um, and I don't know if you know Filippo Valsorda. He's the, the Go crypto guy. He's really good. He, he's an open source maintainer, basically. He's kind of a, uh, so he has some good ideas as well. So I'll let you look at this list, um, and I'll talk about a few specifics here. I'm going to skip merchandise because it's fun, but you get the idea. Private support, though. So again, I would avoid free help um, in private. It just takes so much time and doesn't serve other people. So don't do that for free. And um, this can look like emails, calls, chats. You can even go on site. And like I said, you might have to kind of help work with a company until they commit. But um, but definitely don't troubleshoot their things for free. Um, and you could give presentations. Uh, if you are the world expert on your software, then there are corporate trainings, there's presentations, there's books you could write. You want to help people become experts in your software as well. And who better to learn from than you? And... So let's see here, hosted version. Sorry, I have to go through this quick because this is like a condensed version of the, the one I gave earlier. Um, a hosted version. So this is the definition of a SaaS, obviously. You can host a version of your software for your clients and totally charge a premium. Um, some companies will do the opposite where a SaaS will charge a premium for like an on-site version, which is kind of interesting. Both are needed depending on the company's needs. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Discourse makes, I'm sure, a ton of money. Grafana makes, they make, they do very well with hosted versions of their free software. Um, you can also do development work about your project. So if clients need some custom work done, you can charge for that. Um, I typically recommend not charging hourly just because uh, that is stressful and can easily become problematic in, well, once you know, you know. But um, I always am pessimistic too. So what I'll do is I'll build stuff like weekly or monthly, typically, or per project. And I'm always kind of pessimistic with my delivery deadlines. And then I end up uh, satisfying customers because I deliver early, so to speak. Now, if a company wants you to do any of these things, and there's probably others, I would charge a premium for these. Uh, NDAs, depending on how invasive they are, like there's a standard, like, don't share our secret keys or something, like, okay. But NDAs, like, you're not even allowed to say that you did work with us, like, that's a huge opportunity cost. And I would definitely charge a premium for signing an NDA like that. A couple other things. Um, I know Jason just talked about we should always ship tests with our code, but you could totally charge for it. Um, <laughs> seriously, they take a lot of time. Sometimes they take a lot more time than the actual code, right? So consider that. Um, and let's see if there's if they need rush delivery. Oh, a proprietary license. So if they're not going to open source their code that you're writing for them. I usually like I, I offer like a 75 to 90 percent discount for open source work. Um, so that's like serious value for a company. If you're writing code that only they can use and you can't even have the rights to it, you should charge for that. On call, that's like a second job. You have to be woken up in the middle of the night sometimes. So charge like it's a second job. Um, and uh, anyway, there's all these sorts of ideas here and just kind of depends on what companies require. But I think the the most productive way to fund most projects is probably sponsorships. And this has gained some traction, thankfully, because GitHub has recently integrated support for this. Um, but sponsorships are, in my definition, they're subscription. They're not a one-time donation. Uh, these are tangible products. So you could like, remember the old days of going to Staples and buying like the new version of Microsoft? office in a box it's kind of like that um and so this is not a again this is don't don't think of this as a donation system as you 
set this up and pursue this. These are products you're offering, basically. Um, and so I'm going to talk about this here for just a few minutes as I wrap up. But when you set sponsorship tiers, make sure to consider who your market is and what they need. So I have four sets of tiers, actually, and two tiers in each set. Um, I've got sets for individuals. So just kind of a random person. It's cheap, $25 a month. Um, as kind of a thank you, you get access to some specialized like training material I wrote. But then if you're like a professional individual, it's like $50 a month. And then you get, I can answer an occasional email, basically. Um, and I have tiers for startups, established businesses, and enterprises. And then... Um, you can offer support as a perk. So a lot of companies that ask for a support contract, offer them a sponsorship. Sponsorships are great too, because it kind of, the perks go both ways. They get more than just support. You can feature them on your website. You can interview them. You can give, give them some publicity, give them something to show off. This is great for their portfolio too. Um, I would call sponsorship software insurance, but I can't because that's not legally allowed. But they are assurance that you will continue to maintain the project and support it. And so you can think of it like that. And companies will pay for this peace of mind. Um, but I do really want to move our industry beyond this notion that sponsorships are donations and that sponsoring open source is out of the kindness of your heart. That's good. I don't want to discourage it, but I want to take it the next step now and like let's establish some business relationships. If we're serious about funding our open source projects, um, then let's get the assurance that businesses need. And so what I would recommend here is to get your project in as many places as you can. I experimented with like weird licensing stuff and now you see projects that switch, like they've actually adjusted their licensing so it's not an open source license anymore or it's arguably open source but um and that's fine obviously and it's totally understandable but it does make things a little harder when it comes to companies getting the approval from their legal teams because now oh, there's this weird license they need to figure out or or people just hate you if you just like do a dual licensing thing and make it confusing and so Get rid of all that, I would recommend. Get rid of all that and just stick with the mainstream licenses. Build up your sponsorships and your community. Um, and most sponsors will probably just want you to keep doing what you're doing and maybe be there for them if they email you or something. So um, that's the gist of my talk. That was very fast, sorry. But thank you for listening. And um, I want to remind you that your company can be a leader by sponsoring, for example, the Caddy Project. We would love to be an example for the rest of the open source community as we um, demonstrate how these principles work and how companies can um, bolster up their products and also support the open source ecosystem. So if you want to be involved in that, let me know. Um, and I say go be awesome because, well, it's a pun, but, <laughs> but go and be awesome. So thank you. Yes,